Okay, I've called this lecture, The Gospel Comes to the People. Um, the reason being that since many churches wouldn't accommodate the preachers of this great awakening, they decided that they would no longer preach where they were not welcome, but rather they would go out to where the people were, people who would perhaps never come inside a church. Uh, let's just quickly review what we picked up uh, during the lecture last week. We're in a time when the churches in England, that's both the established church, the Church of England, and the dissenting churches, the nonconformists, uh, were very weak. They had replaced a living and a vibrant gospel with a cold morality, with a barren orthodoxy, with formality and reasoning. Uh, the bishops and uh, the ministers in the churches both were of the same mind, certainly in the Church of England. What they wanted most of all was a life of ease and of leisure. And most of them looked at the activities of Whitfield and Wesley and the other men that the Lord raised up at this time as enthusiasm. They were fanatics. They didn't like the fact that they were coming to rock the boat of this cozy little arrangement that they worked out for themselves where they had very little trouble and very little work to do and had a very good living. Uh, and because the church's voice was muted, society declined at the same time. The salt lost its saltiness. Ignorance prevailed among the people. The church was largely uh, a subject for uh, mockery and ridicule. And the life of the day was marked by dueling, by adultery, by fornication, gambling, and swearing. And this was thought quite a normal way of life, even for those who were ministers and bishops of the church. And then we saw how it was that in that desperate situation, where England was perhaps on the verge of a revolution somewhat similar to the one that took place in France, God <coughs> intervened. And the way that he intervened was through simple and fervent and direct preaching of the ancient gospel. There was nothing new in the message that was proclaimed. It was the gospel that God had once for all entrusted to the church, but it was rediscovered and it was taken with great power and great simplicity to the people. And one of the men who did that was this man, George Whitfield, a man who in many people's estimation uh, was one of the finest preachers that this earth has ever known. And uh, hopefully we will see why people believe that to be true in this lecture tonight. Because he is such a, an outstanding character, I thought I would get some reinforcements in order to tell his story. And uh, it so happens that for a brief period of time, there is a, a short documentary uh, in which Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones, probably uh, the greatest preacher in, in England, in Wales, uh, of the 20th century, actually takes us around some of the sites of, of Whitfield's ministry and explains it in just 15 minutes. And it really sets the scene and helps you to understand uh, some of the places where he ministered, some of the events of his life. So we'll watch that video now, provided our technology um, will cooperate with us. And then uh, in the, the balance of the lecture, I'll unpack that uh, short documentary and give some more detail on Whitfield, his ministry, his life, and the effects that he had. So if I click this now, hopefully Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones will tell us something about uh, this man, George Whitfield. Is 
Okay, well, hopefully you found that of, of some interest. Um, and it, it's interesting, we'll see a little bit later on something that Spurgeon had to say about Whitfield as well. And you're kind of lining up some of the greatest preachers of the 18th, 19th, and 20th century. But let's uh, get into some of these other slides now, and we'll touch on many of the things that Lloyd-Jones mentioned, but at least you've now seen some of the sites uh, in England where uh, his ministry took place, at least. We know now that he was born uh, to an innkeeper in 1714, the last of seven children. Uh, his father died when he was just two years uh, old, um, and his father was only 35 at the time. And because he was neglected by a, a nurse during uh, his uh, bout of measles, he was left with this cast, this turn in his left eye, uh, something that led his enemies throughout his life uh, somewhat irreverently to refer to him as Dr. Squintum entered Pembroke College in Oxford University and became a Methodist, as we've heard, joining that holy club, uh, striving to live a holy life and to do good works, but trying to do it entirely uh, out of human resources, not because of uh, the indwelling spirit of God, but trying to live the Christian life while still an unbeliever. And... Uh, Ultimately, uh, Whitfield came under a very deep uh, conviction of sin. And you heard about the fastings that he undertook in his attempts to overcome uh, the sin that he became more and more aware of in his own uh, soul and in his heart, uh, almost to the point where he broke his bodily and mental health. Uh, and then finally, by the grace of God, the light dawned. And this is how he describes uh, that event in his life. God was pleased to remove the heavy load, the load of his sin, to enable me to lay hold of his dear son by a living faith and by giving me the spirit of adoption to seal me even to the day of everlasting redemption. With what joy, joy unspeakable, was my soul filled. I know the place. It may be superstitious, but whenever I go to Oxford, I cannot help running to that place where Jesus Christ first revealed himself to me and gave me the new birth. And as the spring of 1735, Whitfield was just 20 years of age. And it was three years before the conversion of the Wesleys, John and Charles. Uh, now to, again, cover some of the ground that uh, Lloyd-Jones has, has explained to us already. He was ordained in 1736 at the hands of the Bishop of Gloucester, preached his first sermon in that city, and he says this, Some few mocked, but most for the present seemed struck, and I have since heard that a complaint has been made to the bishop that I drove 15 mad. And the bishop expressed the hope that the madness might not be forgotten before next Sunday. Uh, at least at that time, he was not out of favor at all in the church. We've heard, though, how he visited America, and on his return, things were very different, and he began this open-air ministry. February of 1739 was when he first uh, preached in the open air. Uh, there were two main reasons for this. The first, as we've seen, is that uh, most of the pulpits were by now completely closed to this fanatic, this enthusiast. Um, who was rocking the boat, the comfort and the ease that, that the church had known for so long. The second, however, was purely practical. There were no churches in England, and I don't think there are even to this day, 
there are soccer stadiums and so on, but you cannot easily house a congregation of 20,000 people in any of the churches that I'm aware of. And so, just for that reason, to be able to address so many people, um, it was necessary to go outside and, uh, and, uh, and speak to them in the open air. Uh, the authorities, of course, severely discouraged the practice, I think because there was continuing in the church, and, and perhaps still is, the idea that the church ground, the ground on which the church is built, is consecrated ground. And to take something holy like the gospel outside that consecrated place uh, to them was highly... Uh, John Wesley also had uh, tremendous misgivings about this whole concept of going out into the open air. Uh, but it was George Whitfield who managed to help him overcome those misgivings uh, so that Wesley himself then engaged in the open air ministry. We'll be hearing about that, God willing, next week. And as the opposition from the, uh, the established churches grew and obviously from the world, uh, so the number of people affected by this gospel ministry and converted uh, was growing as well. Uh, when Whitfield would go out preaching, we didn't see Martin Lloyd-Jones with this. Uh, I don't know how it does at bearing people's weight these days. But he had a portable pulpit that he would take with him uh, so that if he couldn't stand up on a hill and, and gain uh, a view of, of the congregation in that way, he would have this uh, fairly lightweight pulpit and he would set it up and preach from that. Uh, we understand that he preached the law and the gospel in an extraordinarily strong and melodious voice. So that as we heard, uh, one person speculated that he could sway a whole congregation from elation and joy at one moment to weeping and sadness the next just by saying Mesopotamia in different ways. Uh, London and Bristol were the main uh, centers of in the UK. And then, of course, he preached to these neglected coal miners um, at Kingswood near Bristol, where his account says this, at four o'clock I hastened to Kingswood. There were about 10,000 people to hear me. The trees and hedges were full. All was hush. When I began, the sun shone bright and God enabled me to preach for an hour with great power and so loudly that all, I was told, could hear me. The fire is kindled in the country and, I know, all the devils in hell shall not be able to quench it. Uh, Martin Lloyd-Jones read this, how... The first sign that Whitfield had that, that the gospel was striking home to the hearts of these coal miners. You know, they come up out of their mine, out of the mine, and their faces are absolutely blackened with the with the soot uh, from their their, their activity of, of digging out the coal under the ground. And as Whitfield preached the gospel to them with the power of God, and the conviction of the Holy Spirit came upon them, they began to weep. And as they wept and the tears streamed down their, street, their cheeks, you had these white gutters as the soot was washed away where the tears fell uh, and, and the, their skin showed through again. 10,000 people, 20,000 uh, on one occasion, Lloyd-Jones said. Well, that's all very well, but what was the content of his preaching? Uh, Lloyd-Jones has given us some indication of it. Uh, but I thought there would be probably no better way to gain a feel for it than to take a look at some extracts. Many of these are available online, uh, so it's quite easy to look them up and to read them through for yourselves. But what we're going to see is this, and this is really quite interesting. First, the doctrines of grace are throughout his preaching. We know that he had 
uh, a difference of opinion with John Wesley over that. We may see more about that next week. Not that, not that there was um, continued animosity for, for Whitfield's part. Indeed, he always regarded Wesley with tremendous respect. Uh, somebody once said, uh, mischievously, I think, to get Whitfield to speak out against Wesley by saying, Mr. Whitfield, do you think you'll see John Wesley in heaven? And to the delight of the questioner, George Whitfield said, no. And then he said, he will be far too close to the throne for me to see him from where I will be standing. Uh, so he had tremendous admiration for John Wesley, even though uh, they were, because of their differences, uh, unable to continue to work together, a little bit like Paul and Barnabas in the New Testament. Uh, nevertheless, for Whitfield's part, although he did not agree with some of Wesley's doctrines, he had nothing but love and admiration uh, for the man and for the God that both of them were serving. We'll also see that Whitfield was, was a preacher who preached with all his heart. Lloyd-Jones said that. He believed in a felt Christ uh, being preached. We'll see that he wooed people to come to Christ, that he warned people what would happen if they would not come to Christ, that he encouraged people uh, to continue in their walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. To sum it all up, as, as Lloyd-Jones said, he preached exactly the same gospel that we possess today. Let's take a look at some of his sermons. Here's a, 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 a small section from a sermon on Saul's conversion. Who is there among you fearing the Lord? Whose hearts hath the Lord now opened to hearken to the voice of his poor unworthy servant? Surely the Lord will not let me preach in vain. Who is the happy soul that is this day to be washed in the blood of the Lamb? Will no poor sinner take encouragement from Saul to come to Jesus Christ? You are all thronging round, but which of you will touch the Lord Jesus? Another sermon, What Think Ye of Christ? O oh, my brethren, my heart is enlarged towards you. I trust I feel something of that hidden but powerful presence of Christ whilst I am preaching to you. Indeed, it is sweet. It is exceedingly comfortable. All the harm I wish you, who without cause are my enemies, is that you felt the like. Believe me, though it would be hell to my soul to return to a normal, a natural state again, Yet I would willingly change status with you for a little while that you might know what it is to have Christ dwell in your hearts by faith. Do not turn your backs. Do not let the devil hurry you away. Be not afraid of convictions. Do not think worse of the doctrine because preached without the church walls. Our Lord in the days of his flesh preached on a mount, in a ship, and a field. And I am persuaded many have felt his gracious presence here. Another sermon of justification by Christ. I affirm that we all stand in need of being justified on account of the sin of our natures. For we are all chargeable with original sin or the sin of our first parents. Let us then stand a while and see in what deplorable condition each of us comes into the world and still continues till we are translated into a state of grace. For surely nothing can well be a, a, supposed more deplorable than to be born under the curse of God, to be charged with original guilt, 
And not only so, but to be convicted as actual breakers of God's law. The, excuse me, I'm struggling to read this. (laughs) The least breach of which justly deserves eternal damnation. Now, if you were here this morning for our sermon, this section about the deplorable condition in which each of us comes into the world, convicted as actual breakers of God's law, the least breach of which justly deserves eternal damnation. That is the message of the gospel. We heard this morning that it is not uh, preached in many churches today, that that is how we are all born into the world and that we need, therefore, the work of the Lord Jesus Christ or we shall uh, receive that damnation and we will receive it justly for having offended uh, a God who is so infinitely pure and holy. He goes on, there is no possibility of obtaining this justification which we so much want but by the all-perfect obedience and precious death of Jesus Christ. But ye are justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. But this having been in some measure proved by what has been said under the foregoing head, wherein I have shown that neither our repentance, righteousness, nor sacrifice, no, not the obedience and death of angels themselves, could possibly procure justification for us. Nothing remains for me to do head, but to show that Jesus Christ has procured it for us. And he would know, having spent so long trying to work out his own salvation by his own efforts, and it was a failure. The almost Christian is the title of another sermon. To add a word or two of exhortation to you, to excite you to be not only almost, but altogether Christians. Oh, let us scorn all base and treacherous treatment of our King and Saviour, of our God and Creator. Let us not take some pains all our lives to go to heaven and yet plunge ourselves into hell at last. Let us give to God our whole hearts and no longer halt between two opinions. If the world be God, Let us serve that. If pleasure be God, let us serve that. But if the Lord, he be God, let us, oh, let us serve him alone. Alas, why? Why should we stand out any longer? Why should we be so in love with slavery as not wholly to renounce the world, the flesh, and the devil, which, like so many spiritual chains, bind down our souls and hinder them from flying up to God. I hope that gives you something of the passion of the heart and of the doctrine of this man. (coughs) We'll see now that, uh, and and again Lloyd-Jones touched upon this, He was absolutely indefatigable in his labors. He was ministering in London and in Bristol. Those are 70 miles apart, which doesn't sound much to us. But back in those days, that's a long way to travel. Uh, And he was shuttling backwards and forwards all the time. Then he ministered up in Scotland. That's several hundred miles away. And across the border into Wales. And, of course, across the Atlantic into the United States. We've talked about his ministry in England something. In in, in Scotland, uh, there was a revival in 1742 and uh, Whitfield was at the center of that activity at Camberslang near Glasgow. Uh, There were, of course, churches that, that objected to his preaching in any place that opened its doors to him and they objected to him preaching in any church, uh, outside of any church, that wouldn't open its doors to him. 
uh, nevertheless, he did preach. And that great blessing came down and revival from the Lord uh, was uh, continued in Scotland. In Wales, he cooperated with the men that the Lord raised up uh, at the same time as Whitfield and who were uh, very much engaged in revival activity there, uh, the Welsh Methodist movement. Men like Howell Harris, um, who often assisted Whitfield in London. London would, uh, Whitfield would come from London to Wales and help in the work there. It's noteworthy that uh, when they first met, uh, virtually the first thing out of Whitfield's mouth to Howell Harris was, do you know that your sins are forgiven? When was the last time you struck up an acquaintance with somebody and the first thing you said to them was, do you know your sins are forgiven? Daniel Rowlands, God willing, we'll be looking at him uh, in about three weeks' time in our closing lecture of the series. Uh, minister in Llangaitho in Wales and claimed by many people to be uh, one of the greatest preachers since the apostles. Uh, so the Lord was raising up men of extraordinary character at this time, some in England, some in Wales. And then William Williams, the, uh, the author of that hymn um, about Jehovah that we, uh, that we sang outside of Beardsley's recently. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. A minister from Pantacellin in Wales uh, who wrote many hymns and uh, is said to have sung Wales into Methodism. Uh, we heard that uh, Whitfield was the first moderator of uh, the meeting of the Calvinistic Conference at Waterford in Wales in 1743. They uh, drafted some fairly extensive rules for the Calvinistic Methodist Association. And this association tied together uh, Methodism, Calvinistic Methodism, uh, between the, the work going on in England and in Wales. And then in the United States of America, making seven trips sounds quite a lot to us. Uh, that's one-way trips. He, he went to the States three times and returned to England and then uh, traveled across a seventh, uh, sorry, a fourth time to the States, and that's uh, the visit during which he passed away. Uh, so for us to do that would be quite a bit. Uh, for him to do it, which was several weeks on board a, a ship, uh, exposed to danger and storms and, and uh, disease and, and so on, uh, was really quite something. Uh, his first trip was to the colony of Georgia in 1736, where he was so touched by the plight of orphaned children that he opened up an orphanage and uh, then would minister and take up collections as he preached in order to help uh, defer the costs of, of running that orphanage, which was, though, a tremendous burden upon him for the whole of the rest of his life. He visited uh, New England and the middle colonies, and uh, his ministry wherever he went was a source of tremendous blessing. He corresponded with Jonathan Wed Edwards and met him, and uh, I'm sure the fellowship between them was quite a wonderful thing and uh, participated in ministry in the United States during times of tremendous revival here. Now, of course, all of that activity where the Lord is blessing, pouring out His Holy Spirit, where people are being converted in thousands, could not go on without opposition being stimulated. And here is an example of a cartoon of the day, Dr. Squintum's Exaltation or the Reformation. So here is Whitfield, or Dr. Squintum as they like to call him, and he has a, an imp or a, a devil pouring inspiration into his left ear, while this character, I think, is, is said to be fame, listening to Whitfield through an ear trumpet. 
and uh, has a, a trumpet to make a fanfare and a great noise, so an accusation that he was in it for personal fame. Uh, the devil is underneath his podium collecting money. Avarice was laid at his feet, that he was only in it for the money. And, uh, of course, the people, the Lord Jesus is called a friend of, of tax collectors and of sinners and despised for it by uh, the Pharisees. Here are some men soliciting a woman of ill repute. And so uh, the accusation, of course, is that he's conducting his ministry among uh, the outcasts of society. And that was the, the nature of his gospel, that it did just appear, as Lloyd-Jones uh, said, you know, that he was a mob preacher, a preacher to drunken minors and so on and so forth. Now, you, you know the hymn writer William Cooper, I think, who, whose many of his hymns appear in our, in our hymn book today. He was a great poet of his day, uh, contemporary with John Newton in, uh, in the 19th century. And this is what he wrote about Whitfield. He turns white field into Greek and makes it leukonomous. And uh, this is about the opposition that Whitfield endured. Leukonomous. Beneath well-sounding Greek, I slur a name a poet must not speak. Stood pilloried on infamy's high stage and bore the pelting scorn of half an age, 34 years. The very butt of slander and the blot for every dart that malice ever shot. The man that mentioned him at once dismissed all mercy from his lips and sneered and hissed. Now, truth, perform thine office. Waft aside the curtain drawn by prejudice and pride. Reveal, the man is dead, to wandering eyes, this more than monster in his proper guise. In other words, what was the real Whitfield as opposed to the one uh, that he was made out to be in his age? He loved the world that hated him. The tear that dropped upon his Bible was sincere. Assailed by scandal and the tongue of strife, his only answer was a blameless life. And he that forged and he that threw the dart had each a brother's interest in his heart. Paul's love of Christ and steadiness unbribed were copied close in him and well transcribed. He followed Paul, his zeal a kindred flame, his apostolic charity the same. Like him, crossed cheerfully tempestuous seas, forsaking country, kindred, friends, and ease. Like him he labored, and like him, content to bear it, suffered shame where'er he went. I think it gives an idea of some of the opposition. I'm going to tell a story now that uh, is, is quite funny. Um, but I think it's an interesting one. It concerns a prayer meeting uh, during uh, the Evangelistic Movement of Wales conference, uh, which took place each year in the month of August, oftentimes in Aberystwyth on, on, on the coast of Wales. And there was a prayer meeting that took place before each of the meetings at which the gospel would be preached. And there was one man who was, pre uh, was praying, and as he was praying, the, the thought of the persecution that came upon Whitfield and, and uh, his uh, fellow preachers during this time came to his mind. And the fact that we in our day know nothing of that persecution. And uh, you will remember this, which is why I am telling it, uh, but it is quite funny. Uh, but but it's, it's, I'm, I'm hoping that in, in, in the humor, the point will still be made. His prayer went along these lines. Dead cats, Lord. Dead cats. Our forefathers had dead cats thrown at them. 
We don't know what it is to have dead cats thrown at us. Lord, show us what it is to have dead cats thrown at us. Thankfully, that prayer was not literally answered in the prayer meeting. But it is true of Whitfield, that pelting scorn that, uh, that William Cooper referred to on the first slide there, they were pelted. And the things they were pelted with, probably dead cats, were some of the nicer things that they had to put up with. That was the fury of the opposition that came to them because they dared to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and the challenge to us is, you know, we do not know what that is like. And why is that? Why don't we know? The Countess of Huntingdon, a member of the nobility in, 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 in England, Lady Huntingdon, uh, used her wealth and influence to support Whitfield at a time when they were shut out of the church buildings, she used her money to make buildings for them to preach in. It's called the Countess of Huntingdon connection to this very day. And uh, they took, you know, the Church of England has 39 doctrinal articles. The Countess of Huntingdon connection took 13 of them and made it their doctrinal basis. And uh, she founded a college in Wales for the training of ministers. And a bishop of the Church of England complained to the king and queen about the effects of this ministry that the Countess of Huntingdon was undertaking. And the queen said, she puts you all, you bishops, to shame. And the king said, I wish there was a Lady Huntingdon in every diocese of the kingdom. So 34 years, 18,000 sermons, seven transatlantic trips, ministry in Scotland, ministry in England, ministry in Wales, ministry in the United States of America. And at the age of 56, Lord Jesus, he said, I am weary in the work, but not of it. If I have not yet finished my course, let me go and speak for thee once more in the fields. Seal the truth and come home and die. And as we heard, his last field sermon occupied some two hours, very weakly to begin with, but growing in strength as he preached. And he cried out in this sermon in a tone of thunder, it is said, works, works, a man to get to heaven by works? I would as soon think of climbing to the moon on a rope of sand. How willingly would I live forever to preach Christ, but I die to be with him. He arrived at Newburyport, and he was... Uh, in the home where he was going to spend the night and the people came to the door and they begged him to preach again. And uh, he could not say no. He was halfway up the stairs carrying a candle in his hand and he preached again. And as Dallimore says in his biography of Whitfield that we have there in the library, he spoke until the candle flickered burned itself out and died away. Something of an emblem for what was about to happen. Afterwards, a friend said that he wished Whitfield would not preach so much because of the effects it was having on his health. And Whitfield replied, I had rather wear out than rust out. And during that night, he had a severe attack of asthma, died aged 55 or 56, and was buried uh, in the church at Newburyport. And uh, 
Houghton, who wrote um, a little book, a great little book on church history, sketches from church history, says this. So, the greatest evangelist of the modern age, if ever an Englishman lived to the glory of God, it was George Whitfield. They uh, put up a cenotaph in 1828, I think it was, at Newbury Port. Uh, he was buried according to his wishes underneath the pulpit of that church. And uh, this is what the cenotaph says. This cenotaph is erected with affectionate veneration to the memory of the Reverend George Whitfield, born at Gloucester, England, December 16th, 1714, educated at Oxford University, ordained 1736. In a ministry of 34 years, he crossed the Atlantic 13 times and preached more than 18,000 sermons as a soldier of the cross, humble, devout, ardent. He put on the whole armor of God, preferring the honor of Christ to his own interest, repose, reputation, or life. As a Christian orator, his deep piety, disinterested zeal, and vivid imagination gave unexampled energy to his look, action, and utterance. Bold, fervent, pungent, and popular in his eloquence, no other uninspired man ever preached to so large assemblies or enforced the simple truths of the gospel by motives so persuasive and awful and with an influence so powerful to the hearts of his hearers. He died of asthma September 13, 1770, suddenly exchanging his life of unparalleled labors for his eternal rest. Now, the question is, what does the world make of a ministry like this? How can it be explained? Well, his accomplishments can't be explained from a purely natural basis, and so they have to be dismissed. And uh, a few years ago, this, was, this actually appeared in the Wikipedia entry for George Whitfield. It's now in the page of edits, things that have been taken out. But this person wrote this. It's difficult to say wherein the effect of his preaching lay, certainly not in his language or logic, for his printed sermons contain nothing remarkable. It must have been by earnestness and charm of voice that he could attract to him the rich as well as the poor. It couldn't, of course, have been that God took a hold of him, filled him with his spirit, and used him mightily to convict people of their sins and to bring them to Christ from whatever walk of life they may have come. A word about his lasting influence. This is the thing I was talking about earlier on, what Spurgeon made of George Whitfield. There is no end to the interest which attaches to such a man as George Whitfield. Often as I have read his life, I'm conscious of distinct quickening whenever I turn to it. He lived. Other men seem to be only half alive, but Whitfield was all life, fire, wing, force. My own model if I may have such a thing in due subordination to my Lord, is George Whitfield. But with unequal footsteps, I must, must I follow his glorious track. Uh, so, Whitfield had an influence that went on. He isn't much known in the church these days, uh, much regarded, uh, but uh, he still speaks to many of God's children and inspires them uh, to serve the Lord with all their hearts. What should we learn then from this man? Uh, the first is this, in days when people will come into a church to hear the gospel, if we're going to be serious about obeying the commission that our Lord has given us, we need to find ways, as Whitfield did, of taking the gospel out to the people. The second, God honors those who honor him. Uh, Whitfield 
was greatly honored by God. The power that he had, the presence of the Holy Spirit in his ministry is because he put God first, exception, uh, in a most remarkable way. Another thing, one man with God is a majority, or to quote from Scripture, if God is for us, who can be against us? If you calculate the effects of his ministry, the tens of thousands who were either uh, underwent some kind of moral reformation or underwent a thoroughgoing conversion, a whole nation through his preaching and, and that of other men like him that we're studying in this series, a whole nation brought back from the brink. Another thing, the gospel is the power of God to save. There is no doubt about it. If you look at the life of a man like Whitfield and you see uh, what he did, if you can picture the tears coming down the cheeks of those miners at the Kingswood Colliery as they uh, give themselves over to the Lord Jesus Christ, as they turn from their sins, that gospel is still the power of God to save. Another question, are we ready for the dead cats? Are we ready for that pelting scorn? Are we ready to take our stand for Christ, even if it should mean that that should be the result? He was. John Wesley was. Others of that day and age were. And that is why the Lord used them so mightily. One more thing to learn though, is this. A story is told of a house where Whitfield stayed one night and, and the, the owners of the house were, were very well to do and very comfortable, but they did not know the Lord Jesus Christ. And Whitfield felt a little bit awkward receiving their hospitality, but felt that he had to leave them some gospel testimony. And so he took his, his ring that had a, a diamond in it and it said that he etched this phrase into one of the panes of the window of the bedroom where he slept. One thing is needful. And of course that comes from the account where the Lord Jesus was talking to Martha who was busy about so many things. I have to do this, I have to do this, and there's Mary who's taken the better part, sitting at the feet of the Savior. And Martha comes to him and says, Lord, let, let my sister come and help. I've got so much to do. And, and Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're busy about so many things, but one thing is needful. Mary has chosen the better part and it won't be taken from her. You young people at the back, many of us uh, looked at the life of Steve Jobs last night. He did not have the one thing that was needful. He had $8.3 billion. He started three first-rate corporations. He was blessed uh, with a life that was extended despite suffering cancer. And yet all that he could say to us last night was, trust your gut, trust karma, trust anything, just, but just get out there and live your own life. And he never had the one thing that was needful. And having been blessed with so many things, unless he did turn to Christ in his last moments, he has now lost everything. Everything is gone. We need to learn that from Whitfield's handwriting tonight. There is only one thing that matters, and it is to make sure that our souls are secure for eternity and safe in the Lord Jesus Christ. So that is Whitfield. We're going to go on to George, uh, Wes uh, sorry, John Wesley. Then we'll deal with Augustus Toplady who wrote our opening hymn. And then we'll finish with the great Welsh preacher, Daniel Rowlands, as we continue and see the great work that the Lord did in England and Wales in the 18th century. Maybe if we could get the lights up We'll see if there are any questions.
Okay. Are there any questions? Where is Newburyport? Newburyport. That's a very good question. Um, I didn't look it up on a map. Um, but yes, VJ. Right. In fact, the name of the church, uh, and I can remember this story from a few years ago, um, I believe the crypt still exists. It's uh, something called the Old South Church in Newbury. Now, I was talking with, uh, with Sean about this the other day because um, I know of a church in London where uh, another famous preacher, not, uh, probably not quite so well known this side of the Atlantic, but a, a guy called Joseph Irons, I. R-O-N-S, is also buried under the pulpit. And uh, Howell Jones, who now is teaching down at Westminster, uh, when I first knew him, was the minister of that church and preached on top of Joseph Irons, I suppose. Um, <laughs> but yes, Whitfield, according to his last wishes, his, he was buried under the pulpit in that, in that church. Ty. I know <clears throat> this last Wednesday evening, Why did he make that request? You said you would research it more? And I haven't been able to come up with an answer, but we will know one day. I'm not sure. I don't know if that would ever have been written down, but um, if I do come across it, I'll let you know. Donna. Um, I'm assuming he never married. He did marry, um, although uh, from I'm, I'm thinking back now to, to when I read his autobiography, not his autobiography, his biography by uh, Arnold Dallimore. It's two colorful volumes in the very left-hand bookcase. They're fairly lengthy, but I would thoroughly recommend them to everyone. Dallimore is a great historian, but he writes in a very readable way, and he doesn't just cover Whitfield. He covers the whole period of... Um, the Great Awakening and all the characters and the interactions between them. He had what was not thought to have been, well, it's thought to have been a very unusual marriage as far as I can recall. Um, as you might imagine, he wasn't actually home a great deal, um, but he did marry. Yes, Ty. Austin? I don't recall. I can look that up and, uh, or, <laughs> or BJ can. <laughs> we'll get back to you on that one. We're not even going to use, we're going to use old tech and not Google to answer that one. It, it's a challenge. I, we've gone slightly longer than we really wanted to. Um, but it, it's kind of with fear and trembling that you attempt to uh, to address the life of a man like this and to do it within the compass of a little over an hour. Um, his life deserves far more study. Uh, what's interesting as well is how, how he, his attitude was that he didn't want really, I don't think, his name to be perpetuated. He wanted Christ to be perpetuated and, and sure enough, I think Dallimore makes this point in the opening pages of, of the biography. For a long time, he was essentially forgotten as having had anything to do with the Great Awakening or, or the, the movement of Methodism. But John Wesley wouldn't even have preached in the open air if it were not for Whitfield. And certainly the, the Methodist movement in the United States owes a tremendous amount more probably to George Whitfield than, than to John Wesley, uh, at least in its opening years. Donna. Um, th there was a distinction made um, between the, the Welsh Methodist movement and then the Calvinistic Methodist movement. Am I, I'm, I'm <coughs> right in that? And do you know the distinction between the two? Well, I think the Calvinistic Methodists um, there were branches of it in England and Wales. It's a feature of the fact that um, Whitfield and John Wesley were not able to continue to work together. They were both 
Uh, I mean, uh, in the early days, to be called a Methodist was an insult. It was, it was um, a term of sort of uh, abuse, yeah, derision. Oh, them, they're Methodists. Uh, but they took it upon themselves to, as, a, as a badge of honor in a way. But um, as you know, John Wesley did not hold to views that, uh, that, that we might call Calvinistic as far as his theology was concerned. That was the main point of contention between George Whitfield and John Wesley. And so there were others like-minded with Whitfield while Wesley was establishing and ordering and organizing uh, the, the other Methodism, they established themselves as the Calvinistic Methodists. And I think that conference where Whitfield was the first moderator was a meeting of Calvinistic Methodists, both from Wales and from England. I think, Pam, that, it's, that Calvinistic Methodism kind of died away in England to a large extent. You don't see that. But to this day, you will find Calvinistic Methodist chapels uh, in Wales. And, there are, and Wesleyan Methodism being... So, yeah, it, it kind of dates back to that um, parting of the ways between Whitfield and Wesley. Time. Did uh, you come across any writings between Charles Wesley and uh, I didn't, but I'm sure that there are that they are in existence. Again, Charles Wesley and, and John Wesley were not I don't, didn't necessarily agree on everything and work together in everything. I think uh, they were quite. Uh, quite separate in their endeavors for the Lord. I think, Sean, you were saying something about that quite recently. I think it was uh, last year when we, what day was it? Yeah, when we were looking at the hymn writers, uh, because that was a revelation for me that Wesley, or that Charles Wesley was his own man and had his own thoughts. I thought they'd work together much more closely than that, but apparently not. Yeah. Donna. So then, uh, Whitfield, though, he, he was, didn't ever pastor a church. He was, he was always an evangelist, or is that, is that the way? The best of my knowledge, he pastored a much larger church. And then where does that say that it forms his organization? <clears throat> yeah, I, I'm sure it'll come out next week. John Wesley had a phenomenal gift of administration and organization, and he, and he set up the structure of the Methodist um, chapels and how they would have circuits of, of preachers and, and so on. It was all highly organized under him. Time? Did you come across any writings where uh, Whitfield Well, I mean, to answer that, this is, this is a speculative answer, but he was thrown out of the Church of England, effectively. Um, and the doctrines that he preached were not welcome in the established church, by and large. So you have, the, I mean, the Countess of Huntingdon connection is, it's kind of an offshoot of the Church of England, but it is not the Church of England. It doesn't have the whole of the 39 articles as a doctrinal basis. I don't think, um, uh, and it's, again, it's interesting how some of these men seem to fly against the conventional wisdom. I don't think George Whitfield was terribly denominational in his thinking. I think he was Christocentric. I think to him Christ was everything and that people could come to know Christ and that then they would then be in a place where their souls could be nurtured. I think that was everything. And if you, if you look at you know, these three men that we've, been, we've had up on the screen tonight, Lloyd-Jones was saying earlier on, uh, 
to the best of my knowledge, no seminary education. Um, very hard to actually, he doesn't speak a lot about church government and denominations and certainly made an appeal in the 1960s to the evangelicals within the Church of England to come out and form a kind of new evangelical um, activity. I'm not sure he would have called it a denomination, but a, a, a group of, of like-minded evangelicals to, to preach the gospel, uh, which ultimately didn't happen. Uh, Spurgeon, no seminary education, um, was considering it at one point in time, and, and then the Lord brought very forcefully to his mind the verse, Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not. And uh, he concluded that um, his motives for wanting to go to, to get a qualification in a, in a Bible college or whatever were not pure motives, and that uh, the Lord had qualified him for the ministry. So, um, and again, Spurgeon's admiration for Bishop Ryle in the Church of England. You know, these, these men were not confined to human denominations. They had a much bigger vision and a much bigger sense of, of fellowship in the Lord Jesus Christ and, and the glory of the church that, that, that the Lord has saved. Too often we divide and divide and divide, and if, if our if the residual sin that's in us had its way, we would each be our own denomination because we'd always find something to, to disagree with a brother or a sister about. Well, that, that wasn't the mind of Whitfield. It wasn't the mind of Spurgeon. It wasn't the mind of Lloyd-Jones. It wasn't the mind of Christ either. Um, so I think we have something to learn from these men. Any other questions. Okay, well we can talk more over refreshments.